I want to thank you all very much for coming. This is actually the last of the fall Lowell Lecture Series at the New England Aquarium, and therefore the anchor. So we called out our best speaker for the evening. And um, I want to thank, not to talk him up too much, but um, I want to thank very much the Lowell Institute for supporting um, this series and other Lowell programs at the Aquarium, which they've done for a number of years. And I want to thank you for your support of the Aquarium and our programs, and hope that you enjoy them. And many of you are aware that we are videotaping most of these lectures and making them available via the internet. You can actually, if you've missed some, um, as soon as we are able to get them onto the WGBH Forum Network website, you'll be able to watch the ones you missed or come back and watch again one that you enjoyed. Um, this, is, as I said, is a close of this fall series. However, there is a special presentation scheduled for Monday, December 13th that at, in this room at 7 o'clock. That's um, a pre presentation by Dave and Yaya Martin, who with their three children lived for two and a half years on a 32-foot boat. And they did not live where it was warm. They went up to Iceland and uh, Norway, and they overwintered in the north. So quite an interesting story for those of us that think we might like to live on a boat. Uh, and I'm sure they'll have wonderful, I've seen some of their photographs, they have beautiful photographs, and I've read, I haven't finished their book, but it's, it's a very interesting story. So if you're interested in that, look on the front table. There's just one flyer, please don't take it, but, but look for it. And it, the information is on the same website as the other lectures, if you're aware of that. Um, it's newenglandaquarium.org slash Lowell04. Okay, without further ado, let me take a stab at introducing Scott Krause. He's our Vice President of Research at the New England Aquarium. He's been leading in the study of North Atlantic right whales for at least 25 years, not more, and he refused to send me his resume so that I could actually prepare a uh, introductory remarks. But he's a graduate of the College of the Atlantic, the University of Massachusetts at Boston, and he did his uh, PhD dissertation at the University of New Hampshire. Scott also has been known occasionally to um, give a really wonderful presentation. Recently, he spent a couple of <laughs> occasionally. So, like, I'm a, tr truth is, truth is, I know him by reputation as a speaker. I've never actually heard his presentation, but. 25 years of work, he's got to know a little bit. And so recently he spent two weeks in the Bahamas having a good time and writing. And he's working on, he's working on a book about right whales. So um, he's just been thinking really hard about this topic and has at least two weeks worth of presentation to tell you in about 45 minutes. So um, Scott, thank you so much for coming. It's been a great series in celebration of long-term marine mammal studies and I'm glad you're here to round it out. This is going to be an off night, though. Um, can you all hear me, or do I need to wear that other microphone? You can hear me, right? In the back? OK. Um, well, I have been studying right whales for 25 years. My mother still keeps hoping I'll get a job someday. <clears throat> this is a North Atlantic right whale. And as our colleague Greg Stone, who's the vice president for conservation here, once pointed out, is that this is a rather ugly creature, and if it were about four inches long and on your kitchen floor, you would step on it. <laughs> and it's really something about the size of it, it that really conveys a sense of wonder and magnificence to us. Um, and I'm going to go through quite a bit of detail about how the study here started and the history of the study and then the history of right whales and also what the future holds for them. Um, right whales are... Uh, as I said, and you can see, relatively funny-looking creatures. They have no dorsal fin. They grow to about 50 feet in length. And this uh, stuff on their heads, you, what you're looking at, just to orient you, this whale is facing toward you. This is the nose or the rostrum. This is all lower jaw here. The jawline actually wraps around the face and curves down underwater here, and the eyeballs are underwater and back. These white things here are called callosities. And callosities are made up of uh, cornified skin that forms distinctive patterns on the head. <clears throat> and then it's covered with cyamids, which are whale lice. And so the white coloration is actually parasites. An average right whale carries about a million of those things around in case you ever feel like you want to scratch something. <clears throat> 
We started this program in 1980, and uh, it continues today. Um, it was originally started by myself and John Prescott, or then the director of the aquarium, who uh, had the vision and foresight to see that this was an area that needed some work. And we were also very lucky in terms of what we discovered and how we discovered it. Now, the history of right whales is not a good one. Uh, Right whaling started uh, over a thousand years ago in the Bay of Biscay in Spain, and it actually was the Basque whalers that developed the prototype, what we think of as Yankee whaling, using uh, sailing ships and small boats to launch off them and collect whales and then bring them back to the ship and try them out. And the Basques first developed whaling in the coastal zone of the Bay of Biscay, probably a little bit like a volunteer fire department. There'd be some watchman waiting for whales to swim by, and they'd ring a, t a bell, and everybody would run down, they'd row out, they'd kill the whale, tow it in, and plunge it out. And in fact, that kind of shore whaling probably existed for a couple hundred years before they got into the more offshore work. They hunted most of the right whales in the eastern North Atlantic. That is to say, the European stock of right whales was mostly depleted by the 1400s. And the Basques, who were good sailors and very entrepreneurial, actually moved first to uh, Iceland and did some whaling there, and then set up shop in the coastal waters of Labrador and established several whaling stations up and down that coast that they used from, for about 100 years, between 1500 and 1600. And during that time, they took between 25,000 and 40,000 whales. We used to think it was equal numbers of bowheads and right whales, but now it's believed, based upon new genetic data, that most of the whales were bowheads and that just a few right whales were were killed. But starting around 1630, and with the heyday really between 1650 and 1750, right whales were killed by New England whalers pretty extensively from about Cape Hatteras up to, um, up to Cape Cod. And uh, during that time, about 3,000 right whales were killed in uh, North Atlantic waters. And then there was another little uh, pulse of whaling. The right whaling really stopped at that point. And you'll, if you're historians of whaling, you'll notice that Around 1750, the whalers started to go abroad, basically started going after gray whales on the west coast and then uh, bowheads uh, in the Arctic. And they also killed, uh, then it became the, sort of the big, the thing that we think of because we know Moby Dick is really a sperm whaling fishery in the South Pacific, um, which was mostly in the 1800s. But in the late 1800s, it turns out more right whales were discovered in a few obscure places in the North Atlantic, and another little spate of right whaling started. And between about 18, I said 1850 here is when it really started, but there was a real pulse of right whaling between 1880 and 1910 in uh, uh, Little Bay in North Africa, off the coast of Ireland and Scotland, uh, at a high seas whaling ground between Greenland and Iceland and in the coastal waters of Florida and Georgia. Go figure. But it turns out that during that time, they killed a couple hundred, of right, couple hundred right whales and probably brought the population just about to extinction. By the early 20th century, we don't know exactly how many right whales there were, but it could have been as few as a couple of dozen animals. Now, there's a very interesting story here that I thought I would share. The last right whale killed in the United States intentionally was taken in 1935 off the coast of Florida by a sport fishing boat that went out looking for tuna and discovered a mother and calf right whale and decided, oh, gee, this is big. Let's kill this. And so the guy, this is, and they had a Herald, New York Herald Tribune photographer on board. So this is a picture of the guy harpooning the calf. You, uh, in, a cl in the original photograph, you can see the calf underwater there. You can sort of make it out um, at the very bottom of the image and um, down in here. And this is the mother. And the mother is a whale known to us as number 1045. It was still alive in 1995. And the sightings that we had for it uh, were the 1935 sighting, and during that time, they killed the calf, they shot hundreds of high-powered rifle bullets into the mother and drove her away, and apparently took them about six hours to kill the calf, and then they brought it in, and like you would do with a tuna fish, they hung it up on the dock, and there's amazing photographs from this uh, spread in the New York Herald Tribune of all this event, and quite a dramatic story to go with it. Well, we wouldn't think anything about it except that this whale was photographed again. The mother was photographed again in 1959 in Cape Cod Bay by 
the pioneering scientists uh, Bill Cheville and Bill Watkins of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And <clears throat> we got the photographs many years later and made the match. It was seen again in 1985 in Jeffrey's Ledge off of New Hampshire, then again in 92 in Cape Cod Bay. And then in 1995, the National Marine Fisheries Service photographed the mother off of uh, George's Bank. Uh, on, an, on an offshore research cruise, and at that sighting, there was a very large gash from a ship in her head, and we don't think she survived that. What's interesting about this is that she was never seen again with a mother. It's possible that she was wounded in some way that prevented her from giving birth again, or that she continued to give birth and she was never seen, because there weren't any researchers really looking between 1935 and 1960. At any rate, it is an animal that bridges the whaling era and the whale research and conservation era, and it's pretty amazing. We'll come back to it later. <clears throat> now, the aquarium got involved because in 1979, the Pittston Oil Company wanted to build a refinery and a deep water port in East Port, Maine. Anybody who's been in down East Maine knows how pretty it is. There's a few images to show you how pretty it is. Small villages, uh, pretty rich resources, big intertidal zone, lots of productivity and uh, relatively unspoiled by industrial development. The National Marine Fishery Service asked us, asked John Prescott and myself, to survey the area around Eastport and the greater, the lower Bay of Fundy where tankers would go through to determine what kind of marine mammals there were in the area because their environmental impact statement said, well, we have no information on marine mammals in this area and therefore there will be no impact. And uh, it's actually kind of it's the logic you could use in this administration. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. <laughs> My funding's in jeopardy. <laughs> um, now, what, what happened was pretty interesting because we saw quite a few marine mammals in the area. It had never been surveyed systematically. We saw, uh, we saw a lot of fin whales, minke whales, humpback whales. But to our surprise, we saw a number of right whales. And they had never been recorded in this area before, and they were never historically hunted in this area. And the reason for that is that the tides and the fog in the Bay of Fundy are such that it would really argue against taking a sailing boat there without an auxiliary motor. So the, so the sail-based whale fishery probably never got into this area. We did surveys basically from uh, here to here all the way up to about almost to St. John, sort of across here and here. This whole area was surveyed by us. And the right whales were discovered in this box here and then in this uh, box in here. The Eastport refinery was proposed for this little spot in there, which is Eastport. And the idea was that ships would, the, they wanted to bring in uh, very large crude carriers. And they wanted to bring them up through the Graham and Ann uh, Basin in around Head Harbor and down this channel, which has uh, four to six knot currents at high ebb or slack tides. So <clears throat> it didn't seem like a very good idea to most people who were concerned about the environment, but the oil company uh, turns out had a number of other woes and right whales and bald eagles and ultimately the economic uh, decline in oil prices worldwide led to the uh, submersion of this proposal, and no one seemed to miss it. Now, in the beginning, we realized that these callosities on their heads were distinctive, and you could tell individuals apart. Now, many of you who've been whale watching have probably seen humpbacks and are aware that if you photograph the underside of the tail of a humpback, it's like a fingerprint. You can tell everyone apart. Well, you can do the same thing with right whales, and the callosities on their heads actually form distinctive patterns. We consider them in two broad categories, broken, that is to say there's smooth skin between the callosity on the tip of the nose and that right in front of the blowholes, or continuous, where the callosity goes continuously along the rostrum. And uh, we use kind of geographical terms to describe callosities, including things like um, peninsulas and islands. Uh, but the bonnet is an old whaler's term. Uh, you can tell these guys have been at sea too long because they thought it looked like a lady's bonnet. Uh, the combing is like what you would have in a sailboat. That is, it splits the water in front of the blowholes to keep the water from going into the blowholes. Um, there are frequently uh, callosities on the lips, and they're all right whales have eyebrow callosities. In other words, callosities form in the same places that 
hair does on human males, sort of mustaches and eyebrows and so on. <clears throat> and you can also see that even to an untrained eye, if you looked at this pattern here or this one here as they're redrawn up here, they're quite distinctively different. Now in the field, it's not quite so easy. But it nevertheless is, you have to remember, we're dealing with just a few hundred animals here. And if you lived in a village of a few hundred, you would know most of the people on site. You might not know their names, but you would know something about them. So in the field, it turns out that we use uh, quick pattern identification, and also we use, uh, we, use, we use some names. People have asked me a lot about this. We don't name all of our right whales, uh, largely because we don't have the imagination. But sometimes names just pop out of your head. Now, for those of you who live through uh, serious rock and roll, this whale is named Van Halen for the guitar-shaped <laughs> velocity. You have to turn your head upside down and be very creative about it. But you get the idea. <clears throat> and there are a lot of whales that we name because of distinctive patterns. For example, a whale named Snowball has a white mark on the left-hand side of the face. Um, and there are whales na there's a whale named Stripe with a stripe across her nose and a few things like that. So we use names when they really help us identify individuals and keep track of individuals. And I have to say that this field identification work is extraordinarily efficient for researchers who are trying to survey and photograph and work through animals on a given day. If you're in an area with 100 right whales and you only get one out of every three days because the weather's so bad, you're out there, you've got one day to try to photograph as many whales as possible. And it's good to know whether you've seen that whale before, whether you've worked it before, whether you've photographed it before, whether you need a biopsy sample. And so at field or in the field identification is really critical. And we have um, a few people. We're fortunate to have three or four people on our research team who can recognize on site about half the population. <clears throat> now, research methods have evolved a lot since the early 1980s. We have always done um, aerial surveys and shipboard surveys. And I thought I would just sort of identify as I go through the history of this program the, when these things started. We started doing the Bay of Fundy surveys in 1980. In 1983, we started our first surveys out on the Nova Scotian shelf um, based upon some historical whaling records. We knew that there were right whales out there. In 1984, based upon historical whaling records from the 1800s, we believed that there was a possibility that if right whales still were calving in the United States, that they were calving off the southeastern United States in the coastal waters of Florida and Georgia. Everyone thought we were insane, um, but a group of Delta pilots volunteered their own flying services and their private aircraft to run a survey down there. And sure enough, they were right whales. We saw four mother calf pairs in the first survey, and uh, it was quite dramatic. Surveys in the southeastern United States have continued every year since then and are now part of a much broader program to keep uh, whales and ships from colliding. Anyways, from these kind of surveys, you learn a lot about distribution, abundance, births and deaths. Uh, migrations between, animal, uh, between different habitats by individual animals. And we've done surveys in the southeastern United States. We're now starting them in the Great South Channel east of Cape Cod. We also work, we've been working continuously since 1980 in the Bay of Fundy between Maine and Nova Scotia. We've been working sporadically off the Nova Scotian shelf um, and sporadically in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We had one expedition up to the uh, Cape Farewell Ground, the old historical whaling ground between Greenland and um, Iceland, where we got the daylights beat out of us and only saw one right well, but that's the joy of research. Um, so we've been surveying right wells all over the place for a, a long time, and the most extraordinary thing about it is, that, is what we don't know about them. <clears throat> we know that mothers and calves go to the southeastern United States to give birth, and <clears throat> they do so in the winter months, and nearly the entire population goes there. There may be a few animals that don't give birth down there, but we don't see them very often. It might be represent one or, one or two every four or five years. Then they migrate in the springtime up the coast to Cape Cod Bay and the Great South Channel right here. And these two areas are known as the springtime feeding grounds for about two-thirds of the population. Then in the summertime, we see right whales on Browns Bank or the Nova Scotian Shelf area, sometimes referred to as Roseway Basin. Sorry for all the names. But anyways, it's this place south of Nova Scotia and in the Bay of Fundy. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is sort of the, 
This is the spring and summer and fall distribution of right whales as we know it. But in the wintertime, only mothers and calves and a few other individuals go down here. Two-thirds of the population is missing in the winter months. No matter all the surveys that we've done, we still don't know about the winter. And in the summertime, a third of the population disappears from this whole Gulf of Maine area and goes somewhere else. And genetic data indicates that a number of the animals that we see, the fathers have not been photographically identified. And it adds, spe there's speculation that there's a, third, there's a second summering ground somewhere offshore that we have not yet identified and that there may be more right whales there than we think we have in the population. Um, there have been scattered sightings of right whales in uh, various parts of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, around Newfoundland, the Flemish Cap, up around uh, Greenland and Iceland. And we had one right whale leave uh, the Great South Channel one spring and go to Norway for September, and then the next spring it was back in the Great South Channel. Now that's quite a little swim. But, and why, who knows? Uh, no idea. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that for this group of animals that lives in the Gulf of Maine, and for all right whales that calve in this area, the coastal zone of the United States and Canada is their habitat. They're usually within 50 miles of shore and frequently closer. In 1988, we started a program with uh, Moira Brown, who's sitting in this, is sitting in the corner over here, trying to look invisible, and. Um, it was, all, and it was in conjunction with Dr. Brad White, who was then at McMaster University in Ontario and is now at Trent University. And uh, the biopsy darting program was developed because we realized in a small population like this there may be genetic issues with regard to reproduction. And uh, there was also a lot of other things that we were interested in, including contaminants, because you can get bits of blubber from biopsy darts and you can test for contaminants. Um, so that program started in 1988, and to date we have biopsied, I believe, three quarters of the extant population of right whales. So in terms of a genetic profile, it's probably one of the best well-known wildlife populations in the world. In 1997, a friend of ours at Woods Hole Oceanographic named Michael Moore came up with the idea that maybe we could measure health and blubber thickness in right whales by actually putting the same device you put on pregnant women's bellies onto right whales and actually measuring the thickness of the blubber because you get an impedance change as it goes from lipid to muscle. And so you can actually tell how thick blubber is by putting this little thing on there. So Michael had this idea you could do it. Well, then the trick is how do you get close enough to a right whale to actually measure the blubber? Well, you can see you don't get very close. You get this in enormous long pole. <laughs> And Michael's had a lot of jokes made about him with this very long poll. But at any rate, it does seem to work. And there's a, there's a, a student of his is finishing her PhD dissertation on the results of this kind of work. And that's useful for things like health, health assessments and understanding a little bit about how nutrition uh, helps these animals. And also quite a bit of information about the changes in uh, blubber thickness as you go, th if, if you got pregnant and then you have the baby and you go through lactation, what happens to the female during that time? Yeah? Yes. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Rolland, who's also trying to hide over in the corner here, has started another program in uh, 1999, which may uh, cause everyone to turn up their nose, but in fact is yielding some of the most extraordinary science we've seen in a long time, and that's uh, fecal sampling. This is what they look like. I know people always say, well, what do they look like? Do they, <laughs> they can't believe it. But <clears throat> anyways, this is what they look like, and they, in fact, float in large fields. You can drive into one of these fields of poop and, <clears throat> and easily collect it, and then uh, they spend hours in the lab uh, trying to figure out what it means. And basically, it started out as a way to look at uh, reproductive dysfunction because people were concerned in the 1990s uh, reproduction in right whales really slowed down, and people were concerned about what the causes might be. So her interest was initially in the reproductive hormones to see whether there was a hormonal problem in the males and the females. And then secondarily, it turns out that you can assess whether they've been exposed to red tides and biotoxins. And on top of that, you can d discover things about diseases and parasites. And it turns out you also get a little hormone that tells you about stress. So there's a whole slew of projects. Her, 
Her very simple idea turned into a whole multi-dimensional program, and uh, I'm sure she's regretting it. But it is yielding tremendous information about reproductive cycling and uh, a lot of other things with regard to the health of right whales. Now, <clears throat> I put this in here because the power of this study, there's a lot of very interesting information and miles of publications about specific features of right whale biology. But the power of this study is really going to be in the integration of the data. And this is just one example. So for example, we've been taking photographs for too many years, and we have a catalog of right whales, and we can tell you all about individuals. Now, because of the DNA stuff, we've been able to extract DNA from samples and create genetic profiles for each animal. So what does that mean? Well, here's what it turns, it turns out that in this population, we are going to be able to create an entire family tree. We're going to know who's related to who and just how that happens. We're going to learn a lot about social structure. We're going to learn a lot about inbreeding. And just as an example, I thought I would show you a couple of uh, representative family trees. Uh, the blue are boys and the pink are girls. You know that, right? Uh, and this would be, this is the uh, animal that we're concerned with, a male without a name. We could probably think one up for him. And this male has been uh, mated with three different females, Fermata, Rat, and Stumpy. I apologize for Rat's name, but it looks, it's got a callosity that looks like a rat. What can you do? Um, they had, uh, the Fermata and this whale had a whale named Half Note. You uh, music scholars will recognize this uh, genealogy here. Uh, Fermata is that little point that goes over the Never mind. <laughs> it's, a, it's a distinctive musical notation. And uh, anyways, they, have, they had a child, and Half Note had a baby in 1989 uh, that we have also have not named. So we have a grandchild. We have children and grandchildren from this pairing here. This pairing has offspring uh, of uh, 1610, and this pairing with Stumpy has an offspring of 2710, born in 1997. So this whale's been quite busy, actually. Um, this is one of the more successful males in the population. <coughs> Here's another example, a female named Baldy. Now that I think about it, they're really kind of unpleasant female names. But at any rate, the <coughs> we don't know who the father was, but there were a number of offspring from this, uh, from this whale. And there are also grandchildren, and you can sort of see how the family tree starts to fit together. This is an example of how well we know this population. And what it will allow us to do is actually integrate these kind of information with the information that Roz is getting, for example, on health and reproduction to look at whether certain animals or certain lineages have better reproductive success than others, certain are more prone to disease or skin conditions, whether certain groups are uh, reproductively dysfunctional because of some genetic features. And that's sort of the direction we're going in. Now, <clears throat> the current uh, population size and status is believed to be about 350 animals. And I should point out that the population is isolated from all other right whale populations. There are right whales in the southern hemisphere, one species, and about uh, seven or so different stocks. And there is a population of right whales in the North Pacific. Not very well known, probably numbers uh, several hundred animals, but mostly in the western North Pacific in the Russian seas, so not studied well at all. But uh, this, so this one is isolated, and it's not going to receive any genetic material or additional animals from any other population. They're isolated mostly by the equator. Right whales are so well insulated, they're uh, inhibited from traveling into hot waters because they can't thermoregulate. They can't reduce their heat to a level where they can survive. So the equator is an effective barrier to right whales transiting across it. Um, in this, and then the other final thing about the North Atlantic population is that as far as we can tell at this point, it is declining in size, and it's declining for a number of reasons. Um, this is sort of to review, even, at, even 15 years ago when we first started this, you know, I kept thinking, well, we're going to start working on right whales, and geez, one reproductive cycle is probably three years. So if you go through three reproductive cycles, nine years from now, we can go do something else. Well, nine years later, you realize that You've got declining reproduction, and you've got a lot of mortality from conflicts with shipping and fishing. And so the study just kept going on and on and on. 
Now, there is some protection for right whales. Um, in the United States, we have the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. The United States government has formed, uh, has created critical habitats for right whales, one in the calving ground in the southeastern United States, one in the Great South Channel, and one in Cape Cod Bay. And the government of Canada has created two uh, conservation zones, one in the Bay of Fundy and one in the Roseway Basin. Um, right whales are also protected from all whaling by the International Whaling Commission. And they are protected from, you can't trade in right whale parts by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. But as I pointed out already, there are a lot of unknowns. Uh, this protection may apply in these areas, but right whales spend a lot of time in other areas, and there are also places that we don't know where they are. Um, and the final, one of the important things is that management in this country and in, the, and in Canada is really oriented toward crises. So if you have a lot of entanglements or something, they'll try to close an area rather than actually figuring out what kind of strategy would best eliminate entanglements to begin with. A uh, couple of graphs. you got to do this, right? Um, this is reproduction, and these are all adult females who are greater than sexual maturity. This is, these are adult females greater than sexual maturity who have had calves. And you'll notice the difference here. It's represented in this red line. There's quite a few adult females who have not had calves. Um, you'll notice the blue line here is calving, and I'll show, actually this is probably a better way to show it. These are the number of calves born to the population since 1980. And in the last 15 years, there's been this very peculiar pattern of big years and then declines. And you can see that the most bizarre kind of random patterning here, you've got one calf in 2031, the record in 2001, and we're in another declining phase here. We don't understand the reasons for this. They could be things like, uh, there could be a big <laughs> disease event here, could have been a disease event here. Um, it's very difficult to know why this does this. Uh, it is not, it's not clear whether this is just a uh, feature of this population. Most populations, even very small ones, don't have such a random distribution of calving rates. The average for this entire period is about 12 calves per year. And in spite of this kind of extreme variation, that average has not changed very much. Most calves are born, as I said, in the coastal waters of Florida and Georgia. Most females give birth every three to six years. However, it went from three years in the 80s, the interval between calves went from three years in the 80s to six years by the end of 1999. Um, and there hasn't been any increase that we can detect. Throughout the 90s, calving declined. Uh, the calves per mature female per year dropped uh, significantly over that period of time. It may be recovering now. Over the last four years, we've had very good calving years. But uh, these numbers are very small. Why is reproduction low? There are lots of hypotheses. Um, one is that there has somehow been a diminution of food, and people have speculated that global warming or some kind of climatic change has affected the availability of uh, their food items. Uh, poor nutrition leads to reduced reproduction in almost all mammals, so this is the logical extension of that hypothesis. One is that contaminants are somehow affecting the population, although these guys feed very low on the, low on the food chain. They eat primarily copepods, which are tiny zooplankton, and almost exclusively that's what they eat. And in that case, um, then you would not expect a lot of bioaccumulation. You wouldn't expect animals that live that low in the food chain to get much in the way of contaminants. But there are contaminants that can affect reproduction at extremely low levels. And they're not just the traditional DDT ones that everybody worried about for 30 years, or PCBs. There are a new suite of contaminants that are out there in the ocean, and we have to be thinking about them. There's a possibility some of the patterns look uh, like, some of the patterns in reproduction look like disease, look like disease events. And there's a possibility that that's going on. Biotoxins from red tides. Red tides are increasing around the world. Over the last 20 to 30 years, red tides have been increasing in severity and length. And um, the same thing has happened in the Gulf of Maine. It's possible that red tide is affecting right whales in some way, but we don't know what it is. There's a possibility that there's a genetic, general genetic problems with this species just because they were derived from such low numbers. And we also don't understand very much about habitat requirements.
What do they need? Is it just food that they care about? Some parts of the right whale habitat are extremely noisy, and maybe they can't hear one another to get together. So one can imagine lots of things about habitat that we don't understand. Mortalities in right whales are uh, fairly well documented, at least the ones that come up on the beach. We had 62 deaths, 35% of them are from collisions with ships, another 10% are from fishing gear. That means that 45% of all mortality in right whales is due to human causes. Another 27 plus percent is due to unknown causes, and a lot of these are because carcasses are not retrieved. Many of us feel that if you were able to retrieve more of these carcasses, you would discover that there's a much higher percentage of deaths due to human activities than we currently have identified. In addition, a lot of animals disappear from the population or simply not seen for after a certain point. They probably have died offshore and simply haven't washed ashore for us to examine. So there are animals that die that we don't see. In the shipping case, there is one extraordinary success story, and that is in 2003, largely through the efforts of uh, Mo Brown, um, we were able to move the shipping lanes in the Bay of Fundy to avoid the highest concentrations of right whales. This move, these were the old shipping lanes, these dark blue lines that run down here. And this is a vessel traffic control system, which is the only one in, uh, on the East Coast. And uh, this area is, these are mandatory shipping lanes for ships going into St. John, New Brunswick. The new shipping lanes actually go down here on this side. You see the dark gray line right there and they join up with the old ones about here. And if you look at the old shipping lanes, you can see that right whale distribution, which is in red dots here, actually has a fair number of animals in the outbound shipping lane. This is southbound and northbound will be up and going up this way. The new shipping lanes, in contrast, have almost no right whale sightings within them. There are three down here. And it represents about a 95% reduction in the probability of an encounter between a right whale and a ship. And um, the reason that this was successful is that it was a collaborative effort between scientists, conservationists, and industry, as well as the governments of uh, the government departments of Canada, Transport Canada, and Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And the International Maritime Organization, which had to approve it, went along with it because there was so much support at all levels. So it is possible to make big changes in these kind of uh, in the kind of risks that right whales run, but it is a big effort to do so. The second major problem we see in right whales is entanglements in fishing gear. And uh, there's lots of ways that they get entangled in fixed fishing gear. We don't fully understand it, but uh, we've had um, six deaths, or about 10% of all the deaths that we know about are from fishing gear entanglements. And 72% of all right whales have scars on them that indicate they've been entangled by fishing gear at some time or other. Now, you'd say, well, we could just close off some areas of the ocean, and right whales would be, you know, they could, if we had the critical habitats, that would be fine. If we didn't allow fishing or shipping in certain areas where we knew right whales occurred, that would be fine. What I wanted to show you is this problem that we have, which is that right whales don't actually read the textbooks or pay attention to the, uh, much of the regulatory uh, structure that we like. <clears throat> so this is an animal that arrived, and it did not come across Cape Cod. I'm sorry about that. That is the... An artifact of the uh, mapping program. But this is a right whale that came up from the southeast in the, sp in the springtime with a calf and entered, was first sighted up here uh, off of Gloucester and then traveled around over a three week period in the springtime. This is a rough, this is basically May. And you can see that the critical habitat is here in Cape Cod Bay and also down here in the Great South Channel. Well, they spent a little bit of time in the Great South Channel critical habitat, but really, when you look at the time they spent, most of it was all over the Gulf of Maine. This whale was tagged in the Bay of Fundy in August and spent most of September out here. The critical habitats, again, the Roseway Basin here, well, it did go in there, at least it paid a visit, and the Bay of Fundy, and it, paid, it left there after we tagged it. Um, so <clears throat> the point of this is that these guys don't stay where we put them. And the lines that we draw on the map are not actually very effective at creating closures or managing the, con the conflicts that we have with them. So what are we doing about it? Most researchers and fishermen now believe that the only way to fix the fishing problem is to fix the gear and uh, make it universal. 
So we're working on a bunch of innovative ideas. Uh, we have glow-in-the-dark rope. I brought a sample if any of you would like to go into a closet at some time and look at it. Um, we have ideas of making stiff rope that would uh, actually not bend or wrap around a whale. Um, and we have been developing uh, some other anchoring systems and ideas of making fishing gear that has no ropes at all, electronically triggered so that when the boat goes overhead, the pap trap pops to the surface and there's your lobster. Um, <clears throat> and it's clear from this kind of work that it's really imperative to work with the fishing industry because they are going to have to make the decisions about whether they're going to buy it and use it or not. The other thing that we realize is that nobody actually knows how these entanglements occur. So we're modeling, uh, we're modeling right whale entanglements, and we're doing it with the University of New Hampshire, and um, we're developing. Uh, there's a group up there that's going to build some small right whales and scale the ropes down and fly the whales through the ropes and see what happens and try spinning them around and try to understand the nature of entanglements. And maybe that will lead to some insights in, into gear development that would change this problem. Now, I'd like, to sh I'd like to close with just the idea that this whale really is an urban animal. And most people look at the ocean and you see, you know, sunlight glittering off the surface and you're standing on the beach and really everything looks pretty good because the surf is crashing in, it's a nice day, you don't see very much, might be some birds flying overhead. It's what's going on. And to try to give you an idea of what the whale experiences as it moves up the coast, I thought I would do this. A hypothetical mother and calf. Calf is born in January in the coastal waters of Florida. And uh, I stole these uh, maps from my colleague Amy Knowlton, who's been working on the shipping issue and trying to figure out ways to manage that. And um, they're actually quite good at explaining kind of the shipping piece of this, but I'm going to give you some more details as we go up. So <clears throat> these are the uh, critical habitat in yellow. Up here in blue, there's actually a ship reporting system. All ships that come into this area actually get information on a daily basis about what right wells are in the area and where they are. So theoretically, they could either slow down or avoid them. In close-up, this is what the core of that critical habitat looks like, and this will help you understand the nature of the problem. These are shipping lanes out of Jacksonville, Fernandina Beach. There's also a Trident submarine base here and a Navy, sub, a Navy uh, frigate base here and uh, Brunswick, Georgia. These shipping lanes see uh, cumulatively 3,000 transits a year. We don't know about the military. That's the non-military stuff. All of the red dots are mother-calf pairs. All of the other triangles or squares are single adults or multiple right whales. And you can see it in this area, basically right whales live where the shipping area lives. Now, in addition to this, this is the site of uh, a couple of paper mills, one here and one here. And in the wintertime, most of the southwest winds blow all of the um, high stack emissions offshore. So everybody up in this area is breathing that lovely sulfuric smell of uh, paper. Um, so this is, what this, this is what the calf is born into in January. And it lives in this area for about uh, a month or two. And then the mother decides to head north, usually in the end of February, early March. Um, whoops. The next piece of the journey is this area here. Uh, it could be roughly represented by the arrowed line, the dotted line in here. Notice that all the labeled uh, towns here are ports that handle large shipping. Also, note, remember that North Carolina and South Carolina are fairly heavily agricultural towns, so you've got a lot of... Uh, Agricultural runoff in this area, that means pesticides and fertilizers and uh, basically eutrophic kind of uh, water. It's not processed very much. In addition to that, things like hog farms and other areas have a lot of disease factors, and all of that stuff gets flushed out in effluent as well, not treated. All of these towns do have sewage treatment plants, but they're usually only secondary treatment, and you have uh, a certain amount of effluent going into there. And remember that <clears throat> as, a, as a whale travels along this zone here, it's uh, probably not feeding. So it may only getting washed, it may just be getting washed in this stuff. It may not actually be ingesting any of it. Um, what, it what it almost certainly is doing, though, is being exposed to all the shipping noise, whatever noise is going up and down here, and ships are extremely loud. Now, as you get north of uh, 
As you get north of Cape Hatteras, the big gauntlet here is Norfolk and the Chesapeake Bay, because that's the biggest shipping entrance on the east coast of the U.S. Uh, Delaware Bay and approaches is also not so hot. It's not a great place to be a whale. Um, and at Cape Hatteras, you start to see fishing gear, although it's mostly scattered in offshore areas. It's not the concentrations that you'll see up in the Gulf of Maine later on. But in March, you'll start to see uh, crab traps and uh, gill nets and some lobstering as you get up in this area. These are the major shipping entrances for Chesapeake, Delaware, and New York and New Jersey. Um, and in addition to that, as you get up along these bigger urban cities, you have, a, you have an effluent that you would not normally think about, and that is excessive pharmaceuticals. Um, both, most, the way pharmaceuticals work is that most of you ingest them, and, they, and then you excrete quite a bit of it. You don't need all that aspirin. You don't need all that birth control for it to be working effectively. So what happens, it goes out. It's definitely not treated in the sewage plants, and so it ends up in the ocean here. Uh, in some places, in freshwater systems where it's easily controlled, people have noticed significant changes in reproductive uh, rates in, for example, uh, fish downstream of Las Vegas. Um, one could sort of understand that. But um, we actually don't know what the effects of this kind of effluent is in the open ocean. And it may be dispersed, it may not be, we just don't know. So anyways, these guys are swimming along here, and they get up into the Great South Channel. Oh, yes, always shipping. Remember, there's always shipping. And now you have the, uh, you have the uh, traffic separation zones off of uh, Cape Cod, and <clears throat> you also now have uh, a tremendous amount of fishing in this area here. Starting in the springtime, you'll see gill nets, lobster traps, and uh, in the southern zones, offshore lobster areas, uh, working their way all the way up and down the coast here. And during the summer, these guys, remember, right whales are here in the springtime. And during the summer, uh, as they move up into this area, the entire Gulf of Maine gets filled up with lobster gear. So there's a lot of fishing gear. Uh, there's a lot of shipping, a fair amount of noise, and a fair amount of uh, effluent, some of it treated to varying degrees. Um, and mostly we don't know what the effects of all this are. My point is that these animals are exposed to this stuff throughout their entire lives. <clears throat> when they get to Canada, it probably some of the um, near shore effects ease off. Most, both of these two habitats are 30 miles offshore or thereabouts. But the Bay of Fundy one, for example, is exposed to uh, pesticides from the aquaculture industry. Um, the silviculture interest, industry, both uh, think about uh, St. John's River, which comes down here. This basically is the watershed for all the great woods in northern Maine and a tremendous amount of uh, silvicultural spraying for, in the forestry industry up in uh, New Brunswick. So that all dumps into this area here. So it continues. These, these animals are exposed to a tremendous amount of stuff that if we were living in a city, it basically would be like automobile fumes. Now, whether it affects them or not, we don't know. So what are we doing about this notion of the urban whale to reduce mortality? We're looking at the whale safe fishing gear, and uh, we have a group looking really hard at ways to reduce the conflicts with shipping. Uh, with regard to reproduction, I'm not sure help is the right word. I did put it in there, but <clears throat> we do need to understand it better. It, if it turns out that the reproductive declines in right whales over the last 15 years have been due to activities of ours, we ought to know about it because then we probably can do something about it. One of the great things about right whales with regard to their conservation is that they live a very long time. And so a crisis in one decade doesn't necessarily mean the end of the species. It's not like... Uh, rice rats in the Florida Keys where they only got a couple of years to figure it out before the entire population goes extinct. In this case, these animals are likely to live a long time, and if they don't reproduce for 10 years, well, maybe you can clear up things so that they can reproduce later. Um, at least you have a little bit of time to think about it. But we're trying to understand this whole suite of issues, the contaminants, the disease possibilities, genetics, habitat studies, all of that in an integrated fashion so we can exclude hypotheses and really narrow down on the issues for reproduction. On the habitat protection side, there are still missing right whales. As I said, we don't know where two-thirds of the population goes in the winter and a third of them go in the summer. Understanding that might serve, A, as a control for our inshore population 
and B, it may also provide the future of, the, of this particular species by, be, by occurring in some place that could be protected better than what we have. Uh, we're also trying to understand how right whales use habitat, and that's, uh, you, we're using GIS analyses to do that, um, trying to layer over oceanographic data and a variety of other things to understand why right whales go to particular places. If we could do that, maybe we could manage those places better. And finally, the, uh, the one thing that's uh, important about this, and it's in the theme of this entire lecture series, is that this is a long-term commitment. Right whales live a long time, and you don't get away with just studying them for a couple of years. Now, what do we need to do? What are the future lessons that we have? We know they're in trouble. We know that the fishing and shipping entanglements, or the entanglements from uh, fishing and the shipping industry collisions are responsible for a lot of deaths. The management of those two issues has to be based on really sound science, and that is being developed. That's one of the things that we do. Right whale science is challenged by how long the species live. Many of these animals are going to outlive me, and they're certainly going to outlive my professional career. Um, so life history studies, fully understanding what the life history of a right whale is, takes a long time. And the other problem is that in endangered species studies, you have very small sample sizes. In a given year, if you're just producing a dozen whales, um, you don't really have a lot of statistical power to test whether it's due to some feature of habitat or contaminant or anything else. And so. St standard statistics don't actually work very well on endangered species studies, which means that if you end up in court fighting somebody over an oil refinery, you don't have a strong argument. You could, because the statistics don't stand up in court, they're very, they're uh, wide variation around your estimates, and it's a problem. Um, and I think the one thing we have learned about uh, saving right whales is really that uh, it will take a lot of cooperation between industry and the government agencies as well as the scientists. So can right whales survive in this urban environment? Well, I think that there's two points I want to make. One is it's sort of a thousand year experiment. And that is we started hunting these guys a thousand years ago. We brought them right to the edge of extinction. And then we changed the habitat and we started killing them in new and innovative ways. Now. <clears throat> Can, a right, can, an, can an animal that lives in our coastal zone survive that? I think that there are technological solutions and there are management solutions to both the fishing and shipping issues. I don't think we fully understand the reproduction issues, but I think we will in the next 10 years. And I think we probably, given the right amount of regulatory and governmental will, probably could keep this whale around for a very long time. And the role of researchers in this is really to try to understand all the factors that have caused right whales to just go this close to extinction and still survive, and to identify those ways of living in the ocean that will allow right whales to continue on so our grandkids can see them. Thank you very much. I think um, this embodies the aquarium's mission to present and promote and protect the world of water. So thank you. And um, I'm sure there are a few questions in the audience. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you know why the right whales go to certain areas for cameras? Why one area versus I think that right whales are motivated. The mother right whale is motivated mostly by temperature. She wants to get to a place that's not too hot, so she overheats but not too cold so that the calf, when the calf is born, it has very little blubber. So it probably has to be in a place that's warm enough for the calf to do well, too. And it looks like that is a temperature regime between about 11 and 15 degrees centigrade. So I think it's temperature, but I don't really know. Yeah. Um, you thinking about sightings over the last four or five hundred years. And I'm not sure if I read this right. Um, there was something written that right whales used to come in shore, close to shore, for calving, and maybe they were even seen in place of the day. I've, I've never heard of anything recently for that. Is that, is that true that prior to us being from all, all of the coastlines, they might have actually calved up in this area and come close to shore? It's possible. It probably is, again, it's probably related to temperature, but there are certainly uh, recent sightings of mothers and calves very close to shore in late spring, in April. 
um, or in mid-spring, sort of April, late April, early May, all around uh, Cape Cod, Race Point. And in recent history, I think there are some sightings right off of Nantucket, quite in close into shore. It's entirely possible. I don't, we, you know, there isn't very good evidence for it. There's some evidence they used to be in uh, Delaware Bay as well. And right now, no self-respecting right well would be found in Delaware Bay. <laughs> Uh, are they more susceptible to getting hit by ships not only because they're in the shipping channels, but, it, but because they hang out at the surface more than other whales? They probably hang out at the surface more than other whales. Certainly in Cape Cod Bay and the Great South Channel, they do a lot of feeding. I didn't really talk about behavior of right whales very much, but they do a lot of. They do two things that keep them at the surface a lot. One is skim feeding near the surface, so they're all and they're swimming around with their mouths open for, you know, hours at a time, it's just back and forth near the surface. And the second thing is they engage in courtship activity, and they engage in courtship activity nearly year-round. And that usually involves one female and multiple males. So you could have 10 or 15 or up to 40 animals at the surface for a couple of hours at a time. And they do this without regard to shipping or noise or anything else. So that's a, that's a high-risk time as well. So both of those behaviors put them more at risk than most other species. Oh, sorry. How do they get velocities? Uh, it's just the way it grows, just the way the right whale grows. So, uh, they get large? No, in fact, uh, I think that they may lose velocities as they age. They get sm smoother. I think they might wear down or, I don't know. That's right. Oh, you can't identify them for the first six months. You have to wait until the calf is up here. We don't identify them in the calving ground, but they're not weaned until they're nine or ten months old. So we wait for the mother to show up here, and then we photograph the calf well and identify her after that. So. Yeah. Does the high-speed catamaran allow to the We worry about it all the time. It's a gauntlet that these whales have to run. That boat runs 50 miles an hour twice a day or three times a day or something. It's a lot. And um, crosses right across the zone that they have to travel. And they have had observers on that for years. I don't know if they still do. Do they still have observers? I think they stopped the observers. Yeah. So we don't. I, I don't even want to think about it. So. Have they had collisions? They've had collisions with unidentified objects. They lost, uh, they used to have stabilizers on that thing, and it turns out for that run they take the stabilizers off because they lost them twice, I believe, running into unidentified objects. So, so there's a lot of things. Let's take two more group questions and then people can ask you. Okay, yep. I was intrigued by your story about the whale going over to Norway. Are there studies <laughs> that absolutely show that there are, is not a population of right whales in the, uh, I guess it would be eastern North Atlantic? Right. Uh, there have been a lot of surveys over there and very few right whale sightings. So we feel at least as many surveys as what we've done here, and we feel pretty confident that they would have, un if there had been a concentration somewhere, they would have found them. And we have had colleagues who go went and looked for them in places where they historically were, off of Ireland, uh, Scotland, and in Sintra Bay off the <coughs> north coast of Africa. Nothing. So, yeah. Okay, one more. Anybody else? In the back. Um, so you're doing genetic studies as well, have you found any diversity in the genetics or is it going to be like the cheetah population which has bottlenecked so much that there's very little diversity in the genetics so it's prone to a lot of disease, the, it, the whole population could be decimated by one disease. Right. It is, uh, it's better than cheetahs, it's worse than South Atlantic right whales. Um, I, can't, I don't remember. Do you remember the numbers, Mo? Yeah, I can't remember what the heterozygosity indices are, but they're, um, they, the matrilineal data suggests they descended from five matrilines. So at least five female lines made it through whatever bottleneck it was. The geneticists believe that that bottleneck may go back over a 1,000 years. They don't think necessarily it's uh, something that happened in the 1730s, but I'm not sure if we'll, we'll, we're still working on teasing that out. So the genetic uh, diversity is low, uh, lower than you would like, but 
you know, the cheetah story is like kind of an example to us all. Yes, a disease could theoretically wipe them all out, but in fact, since they're all clones of one another, you would expect that to be a highly vulnerable population. Nevertheless, there's 20,000 of them. So it's not necessarily the death knell for species to be low in the genetic diversity. But in this case, uh, we're just beginning to be able to answer some of those questions, and I think the combination of the health assessments and the hormone data and the genetics data is really going to start to put together a picture of uh, disease resistance and a lot of things that are going to tell us how right wells are going to do. So, Okay, thank you very much.